We're taking your calls, and as I said, Matt's going to be joining us from the Good Guys Car Show. And uh, without Matt, I thought we'd bring in Kurt Rock, one of the flagship bumper-to-bumper shops, to help me help you with your car. So it's good to have you with us, Kurt. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. It's good to be here, Dave. Kurt is up at uh, I-17 in Bell Road. He's been in business for tw- how many years, Kurt? Tw- 25. 25 years. And uh, he's up there right in the middle of a sea of automotive dealerships. And uh, we had the question this morning, Kurt, uh, about, you know, is the dealership better to service the car than, a, than an independent repair shop? The dealership is necessary to do the factory warranty services on any car because they won't pay us to do them through that. As far as better, uh, I don't feel like in most cases that is the case. There may be a few specialty things they're better at. Well, and I look back, I look back 15 years ago, and you bought new cars at the car, you know, the dealership, and the service department was just for warranty work. And dealerships made their money selling cars. Uh, and as the economies change, well, they're not making their money anymore selling cars. They're making something. Uh, but now they've really put their focus in the last decade on the service department. So they, they are out there marketing the service department because that's now become a part of their economic engine. And because of that, and we've done a lot of focus groups with ATRA, which I'm a big part of, which is Automatic Transmission Rebuilders yeah. Association. And the focus groups say that, you know, I have the three main reasons people pick the dealership uh, over an independent refer- repair facility. And I look at them, and I, I don't necessarily know if they're true. I know they're not true. Uh, people will go to the uh, in, uh, to the dealership because they're looking for original equipment parts. Under under the factory warranty, I would say that's probably the case. But I know that uh, I buy a lot of parts from parts suppliers in our neighborhood that tell me that I'm some months I spend almost as much as the dealerships. Now they're using them for all their used cars and all the off factory cars. Okay, so just because you're at the dealership doesn't necessarily mean, if you're under factory warranty, you are going to get a Honda starter per se, but not necessarily if you got 40,000 miles on the vehicle and you need a starter. They may put a different starter on it. And the other thing that people may not understand is is Honda may not manufacture that starter. It may be made by Denso. Yeah, Denso is probably the major manufacturer of that stuff. All that stuff is available to the aftermarket. Yeah, I buy a ton of Denso product as well as you do, I'm sure. So the automotive manufacturer, they do make cars and the sheet metal and all that, and they paint it and they brand it and all that stuff, but they don't make all the components that go into it. So as competitive as the world has become, these parts are, are, are being sold to independents as well as to the factory. They're just private labeled for Honda. That's true. And me and you buy a whole lot of parts that they buy because we buy through uh, a one major warehouse here in town that doesn't sell to the public, that sells strictly to the to the independent high end independent and they sell to the dealership so we have the same product they do on many cases. Well, that's one of the three that I would go with would be original equipment parts. So you're not just going to get original or original parts because you're at the factory or at the dealership, but the independents have access to all that. And just because you're at the dealer doesn't mean you're getting factory parts. And the next thing is the factory training. And this is the one where, you know, whether we're a dealership or an independent refer- repair facility, we all pool or grab our you know, employees from the same pool of talent. Yes, we do. And, uh, you know, there's not a technician in my shop that couldn't go get a job at a dealership tomorrow. That's true. In, in, in vice versa. You could leave the dealership and you could go work for an independent. Well, I have had indep- dealership techs come over, and they're not comfortable outside of their training often, and their training is limited to one brand. So it is a change for them to come to an independent. Well, I tease Matt because Matt started out working for the dealership. And, well, there's and, Case in Poise. Look, look at Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's listening. <laughs> and uh, he is. He's on the line. And and I'm kind of a you know we're kind of a I'm kind of a snob toward the independent. Well, you know I I'm biased. I think the independent's better. And uh, you know my a good friend of mine runs the service department at one of the Honda dealerships. Mm-hmm. And we go around and around about who's better this, who's better that. And uh, the thing I do like about the independent shop is that anytime you want to you can go find the owner and go talk to him if there's an issue. But as far as, uh, you know, the training of the technician, that really comes down to the business, you know, and what the business hires. You know, I hire nothing but the best technician. I won't put up with a mediocre technician. No, you've got to hire. And then the business, and I don't know how you handle it, but in our shop we handle it. That I will pay any training that any technician wants to take. I will pay for it as long as he brings me uh, – 
if, if there's any kind of grade scale, he's got to bring me the best grade available. Man, I'm blessed today not to have Matt Allen with me, <laughs> but uh, somehow he decided he was going to call in. So uh, how you doing, Matt? Dave, you always take an opportunity to pick on me when I'm not there. If it's, you know, <laughs> I, I, and actually I am working. I'm out here at the Good Guys Car Show, and and I got the lucky assignment today because you would not believe how <laughs> I, I I can't believe how big this show is. Well, we flipped a coin for who would be in the studio, uh, whether it be you or, or me that was out there. And uh, yeah, I guess you got lucky. I got the short end of the stick. I got the lucky draw. The hairy guy lost. <laughs> the bald guy won. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And hey, I'm sitting here with uh, John Drummond. He he's the main man here at the Good Guy Show. And um, John, I'm surprised that you know, I've heard about, about the show, show all the time. time I come out. out. I've, I've never been out, but then I, I get here and I'm just amazed at how big it is. What is this Good Guys all about? Well, this is uh, the Good Guys Spring National. Or excuse me, the Good Guys Southwest Nationals, and this is uh, one of the last events on our uh, on our tour that we do every year. And, and we've done uh, out of twenty events, this is our nineteenth stop. So this is the last one of the year. We've been touring the country all year long, doing classic hot rod and custom car festivals all over the country. And coming here to Westworld is kind of like coming home. I mean, we. Uh, you know, we just, this place is geared for cars, of course, with all the car activity here throughout the year. But it's just always a pleasure to come back to the Valley of the Sun. This is such a hotbed for uh, classic car activity. There's just so much going on. And this is a show where everybody comes together, everybody embraces classic cars and just celebrates and, and kind of a festival out here. Yeah, and it's not just um, just classic cars on show, although there is that, but you've got autocross going. I've seen the guys up there. Uh, racing the race, racing the course, racing the stop, so to speak, with their their classic cars. And I understand that's open to the public on Sunday, where you can bring your your your. It doesn't have to be your hot rod; it could be your Porsche or your old Z car if you wanted to, right? Actually, it's uh, yes, you're you're exactly right. Except the, uh, the the prerequisite is it has to be an American-made car or American-powered. So, uh, so um, you know, if you've got one of those late model, I mean, Detroit, the factory in Detroit. I mean, those guys are making some incredible cars right now with the new Dodge Challengers and the Chevy Camaro Rebirth and all that kind of stuff. So, we'd like to welcome all those guys out tomorrow. And you're right, though. I mean, it's an awesome road course. We call it the Autocross. It's set up around cones, and the object is to uh, obviously race the clock to go for the best time and uh, guys come from all over the country we have over we have cars entered here from over 40 states so i mean this is truly a national event and everybody's going for the top prizes on that autocross course just pushing their equipment to see how fast it'll go it's pretty cool to watch yeah it's fun to watch those guys now there's there's um this is the second to last round of this national tour and then you've got something out here called the good guys t12 what, what's that all about you know, this is our terrific. Uh, this is our uh, terrific twelve. We call terrific. it it's the top twelve cars of the entire season. So, if you were to take the aggregate of cars that have showed at a Good Guys event this year, there's well over fifty thousand cars, show cars, classics that have come out and exhibited at our events. These. Uh, they're all they've all been weeded down to the top 12 cars of the year and they're all here from all over the country there's 12 different categories there's trucks there's muscle cars there's hot rod street machines and they're all displayed out here at westworld and one of the cool things that uh that happens for those guys that won these big awards is they get custom toolboxes made by snap-on and this is the first time they get to see their toolbox so their toolboxes are delivered here and it's got photos of their car all over the toolbox so we display the car Cars. We display these custom toolboxes. They're like works of art. And uh, so the people can come see the best cars in the country, literally, right here at Westworld. Well, I mean, speaking of works of art, I'm just amazed. Just took a brief period to walk through the show floor a little bit, and I didn't even get to the cars that are touring. And I'm just amazed. I mean, these cars are beautiful. And it's the cars that, you know, our parents had, the cars that maybe some of the older generation had when they were kids. It was their first car, and it's really neat to see the 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 family event. I mean, you've got people out here with walkers walking around, and you've got kids running around getting their faces painted and working on the model cars, and that's one thing that my daughter's really excited about is the, is the model car section. I've got to find that. Where is that, anyway? <laughs> well, all the kids' activities, we've got clowns and face painting and all the model car activity. That's all happening inside the big brown tent, and you can't miss it. It's about 100 feet tall and about a uh, football about 100, 100 yards long. 
But uh, like you said, I mean, this event is truly a festival. Everybody's out here to celebrate classic automobiles, and uh, it runs the gamut. Like you said, I mean, we've got 85-year-old guys out here, and we've got 8-year-olds out here, and everybody loves classic cars. These, these cars, I'll, I'll explain it like this. When a guy's driving down the freeway in a brand-new Mercedes, people kind of think, oh, that guy might be a snob, like look at the fancy guy. <laughs> but when you drive down the road, when you drive down the road in a 57 Chevy, red with chrome and flames, people go wild. They go apey. They're all waving. They're giving their thumbs up. I mean, these classic cars are, are, are truly uniquely American uh, icons, and people just get so excited to see them. So that's the kind of energy you're seeing out here at the show this weekend. Yeah, it's really cool. I like all the old, uh, you know, the rat rods, the things that are in process. They look like they've got a, a ton of motor under them, but the body looks all rusty. But it's just this gnarly piece of machinery that uh, is just crazy. There's just so much cool stuff out here. Well, Matt, have you gone to the uh, the uh, corral where you can buy stuff, the swap meet? Well, I know. I was just about to ask you, Dave. You're jealous because Dave's favorite thing is the swap meet. He likes to go around and, and uh, you know, look for things. I mean, there's just cool stuff whether it's old tools or old magazines from way back when and, and uh, gas station signs. There's just a lot of really pitching stuff. Well, good deal. Thanks, John, for joining us, and I can't wait to get out there as soon as the show's over. We're going to go to uh, Jerry and Chandler on a 1999 Toyota Camry to see if we can help. Go ahead, Jerry. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, thanks, guys. You know, I just love the good guy show, and I know John Drummond pretty well, so... Uh, fantastic show, unbelievable show. Well, I've got a 99 Toyota Camry, and I just had a rebuilt engine installed. Runs absolutely perfect. The transmission shifts perfect, but there's a check engine light that's, that has come on, and when I, when I took it through the LBD thing, it's calling for a shift solenoid. And I'm just calling to get a little bit of advice on... Does that mean something could be wrong with the transmission, or could it just be an solenoid? Do you feel anything when you drive it? Does it have a symptom? So you're at a red light, the light turns green, you go ahead, take your foot off the brake and give it gas, and let's say you accelerate up to 55 miles an hour. Does anything feel weird or different? It feels absolutely perfect. It shifts perfect, it goes into overdrive perfect, it downshifts perfect. There's absolutely no indication that there's anything wrong with the transmission or anything like that. Do you know beyond the shift solenoid specifically, you've got a couple of shift solenoids, plus you've got a torque converter clutch solenoid. Do you have a definition of that so, uh, code that they pulled out of the computer? I believe it was 0773. But no definition? Because the one I'm thinking of, there's a shift solenoid E5, I think is the code that I'm looking for. Uh, if everything's working, it shifts one, two, three, four, just like it should, that's great. But the one thing you're not going to feel is the torque converter clutch applier lockup. So that solenoid E5 is the one that specifically I'm looking for. And I think the torque converter may not be in look, uh, locking up. And being that you just had an engine repair, it's not uncommon after an engine repair to have a torque converter mess up because the torque converter is the connection between the engine and transmission. So what's going to need to happen is that's going to need to get into a transmission shop or uh, an auto shop that's good with transmissions, just like Kurt's Auto Repair over there in West Phoenix. And they're going to be specifically looking for that lockup. So there's actually the transmission will shift from one to two, two to three, three to four, there's an extra little bump, and you can see it on the tachometer, where it's going to drop an extra 100 or 200 RPM. And it may still bump, but it may still throw that code. The code is for a solenoid, but it's actually a solenoid performance code. Yeah, I I've, I've was thinking after an engine repair and something like that, the best thing to do on that would just to diag, run the diagnostic chart on that code, because he may even find something like a ground that didn't get snug or is a little dirty around there at the transmission and stuff like that that could absolutely set a code like that, and it could be absolutely nothing more than just tightening a ground. So it's, it's a good sign that the transmission still drives and works fine. And a lot of times there are. You can have solenoid issues where, uh, you know, the transmission itself is okay. And that's, that's one of the things I like to point to is just because there's a transmission issue, it doesn't mean the whole transmission is bad. Right, and, and I was also wondering at the time they'd done the tranny if just as a precautionary measure, maybe they service the transmission, put new fluid in it too. And uh, maybe he does have a solenoid that got a little active or something. Well, up first this segment, we're going to go with Scott in Phoenix on a 1996 GMC 1500 van. Go ahead, Scott. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, how you doing? Good. Enjoying the show. Uh, I had a question. Uh, my van is running really, really rough, 
and uh, the, the service engine soon light is on. So uh, I took it to a uh, auto zone, and they they pulled some codes up. It says uh, number I felt uh, number misfire number two cylinder, and they changed the spark plugs, the wires, the um, rotor, and the distributor cap, and also the fuel pump, and that didn't resolve the problem. I had a um, another van, and uh, the timing chain went out. And when this when it started running rough, it just happened one day. I just started started up, and it was running fine. I started up, and then all of a sudden, it just started running really like, like it was really out of time. Do you think it? I'd say they code they said was misfire number two cylinder, but do you think it could be like uh, the timing chain uh, skipped the tooth or something like that? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say the two aren't related. I mean, the two different repairs, but I don't specifically think you would just have a misfire on number two if you jump time. Am I wrong, Kurt? I I, I don't believe that is. I believe you are right. Is that what year did you say that was again, Dave? It was a '96 GMC. Okay, so he's he's running a Vortec motor in that either the four three or the five zero or the five seven, I believe. They have that injector that is so famous. Mm, the spider injector. The spider injector, and there is. Uh, some ways of trying to clean that injector, but I'm I'm going to look at fuel before I do anything else from where he's at. So we still got some more steps. I mean, even though we've tried fuel pumps and fuel filters and, and all these other things, we still yeah. got some diagnostic work yet. To yeah, do. we're going to have to verify. It. There, the other possibility always is carbon or something like that or a burn valve. I mean, you could actually have a bad cylinder causing a number two misfire. I don't know, Matt. How do we do? Well, pretty good. You know what I was going to say is that yeah, timing chain. You're probably going to you would have random multiple misfires, or you know more than just one cylinder. But I think Kurt's right on the money with the with the fuel injector. You know what somebody could do is maybe try if it, an additive in the tank. It's not going to hurt anything. But you know, there's not very many of those things that I believe in. You know, BG or liquid moly or um, you know sea foam. It's worth a try. But, uh, yeah, then, you know, and the fuel pressure is just so important on those Vortec engines. It's got to be, you know, within a pound or two, right, Kurt? Yeah, if it isn't, I think it's 58 pounds minimum to even start the engine. If you're yeah. 57, it won't even start the thing. Let's go with DeVeda in Phoenix on a 2004 Chevrolet Venture. Go ahead, DeVeda. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. I have a 2004 uh, Chevy Venture, and it's been... It, it's been overheating, or the thermostat goes over the, the middle line. What I have seen is when I turn the air conditioner on, it goes all the way back down. I mean, within seconds. Well, I don't know. I think I've got an answer for you, Deveda, and tell me if I'm wrong, Kurt, but I think we've got a cooling fan that's not working, and there's an auxiliary cooling fan that comes on when the air conditioner is on. Yeah, you're overriding that. So either we got a cooling fan not working if or... We've got a uh, coolant temperature sensor that triggers the PCM for that fan that's not triggering the PCM. But when you turn on the air, either way, you override that and you turn the cooling fans on. You know, Dave, I'll chime in on that one. You know, and that's a quick test we do. You have your car in in the summertime, maybe it's overheating. We just want to quickly confirm if the fans are working. First thing we do is just turn the air conditioner on. And that's going to check to see if both fans, if the car has two fans, well, then they, would, they should both be running. And if they're both running with the air conditioner on now, then we just simply have a problem where the coolant temperature sensor, it's just a sensor in the cooling system, and it wants to know. It's going to tell the computer, hey, it's 230 degrees down here, or whatever the predetermined temperature is, and it's going to you know, send a signal up or wave a flag. Hey, guys, turn the fan on for me, please. It's going to turn the fan on. When it cools back down, automatically should turn the fan off, so... Let's go with Ray in Sun City on a 2005, it looks like a Silverado. Go ahead, Ray, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, I have a uh, Duramax diesel and an Allison transmission. And if I let the truck sit for a week or two without driving it, uh, when I do get in to start it and put it in gear, it'll sit there. It won't do anything for about 20 to 30 seconds, and then it takes off. And that's only after the car's been sitting for a while? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, we may be dealing with, uh, how many miles is on this truck? Oh, probably uh, 58,000. 58, 58, <clears throat> with automatic transmission, sometimes when they sit, we deal with a, what we call a bleed-back problem, and that's where all the uh, transmission fluid from the transmission cooler up by the radiator and in the radiator, uh, as well as the fluid in the torque converter, 
will run back into the transmission pan. And the way you can see if you have a real bleed black problem is to, you know, when the car, you turn the car off, is to check the level on the dipstick and mark it. And then the next morning before you start it or after the vehicle has sat, go ahead and pull that dipstick and see how much the fluid is moving on the dipstick to see if we really have a, you know, a severe drain back problem. But it's not unusual after a car has been sitting for a week or two for the thing to get primed and everything to be working good. That Allison transmission at 50,000 miles is barely broken in. That's it. I mean, and I tell people, we've been doing, uh, you know, I've, for as long as I've been in the transmission business, we hardly rebuild Allisons. They just don't go bad. I mean, everything is literally three times the size it's a very good transmission so anyway i think you're fine there i think i think it's normal but like i say if you do want to check to see if you got a bleed back problem you can monitor the dipstick when the car isn't running from day to day just to see what that fluid level is well today since we've been talking about dealerships or independents and i think you can get good service at the dealership yes sir I, i'm biased i think you get great service at the independence absolutely or, or good independence and the factor fiction for today and i think a lot of people are concerned about this and they don't you know they're concerned that i have to go to the dealership in order to maintain my factory warranty kurt factor fiction that is a fiction matt I'm going to give it a big old fat F for Vic Cone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that's one of the three things we found in our focus groups. We found that they go to the dealership because they get OEM parts. I'm going to dispel that, and we did dispel that. Uh, they also go to the dealership for factory trained technicians. I will let everybody know that my technician could leave my shop and go get a job at a dealership tomorrow, and vice versa. So we have, yes. you know, you a lot of. Stole my line, Dave. Okay. <laughs> a but, lot of independents, we do have guys in our shop that have started in the dealership. Matt yes, started in the dealership. That's why he's not as good as me. <laughs> but. <laughs> but you can start at the dealership and move. So uh, Kurt's probably got a good Ford guy. Maybe he's got a good Chrysler guy. And not only that, we communicate with dealership technicians from time to time. It goes back and forth. Yeah, my guys do a lot of training across the street at the dealerships because of the parts we buy. Many of them are AC Delco. AC Delco is a factory GM part, and they offer us training, and we train at the dealerships all the time. Right, so it's not uh, so you don't have to go there for warranty. And you mentioned that Congress made rules about that right. a number of years ago. In yeah, order you, to have your warranty, you don't have to go. To the yeah, that would be a, called a monopoly, and I think that's against the law. So you can have your oil changed and your service. You can have Dave do a tranny service for you, and it doesn't affect your your factory warranty at all. Well, but, what I like to what I like to tell people, Dave, and the customers ask the same thing, or we'll co- they'll come in, or I haven't seen a customer in a long time, and say, "Mary, where have you been? Well, I bought a new car." That's okay. You know, it's the, what I tell them, the only reason you need to go back to where you bought that car is if it's free. <laughs> <laughs> it's not free. There's no reason to go back. Right. We can handle everything and to, you know, uh, you know, maybe even higher standards. Dave, like I was talking about, I think it's probably time to go to, to the break, but uh, we had a case with a BMW the other day with the, the manufacturer. They want to replace the entire transfer case motor for $1,500. But we can fix it for 600 They won't fix things at the dealer sometimes. There's a little bit more plug-and-play apart. So take out a transmission, put yeah. it in a transmission, but n- not necessarily fix the component in the car. And that's one big difference I do see. A lot more independents were, are more willing to do those kind of repairs as opposed to just you know calling up BMW and getting another electric motor for $1,500 for the yeah. transfer case. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's definitely one of the differences you know that I see. So yeah, the other thing I want to make a point of, too, is you do want to keep your factory warranty good. So you don't want to compromise that by doing service, not following your service schedule. So when you are picking an auto repair shop, you got to make sure you're working with a quality shop that is completely aware of what's necessary from the factory to keep your warranty current. And that's why I say any of the shops at bumper to bumper radio.com are good shops who are going to be cognizant of that and are not going to do bad service and jeopardize your warranty. Let's go with Sue in Sun City on a 2007 Ford Escape. Go ahead, Sue. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Uh, my <clears throat> Ford Escape's gas mileage has dropped from t- 23 miles per gallon down to 17. Uh, I was wondering. Do you think that it could be the uh, thing that tells me how many miles per gallon that I'm getting, or do you think I have a problem with a fuel pump or what? Hey, Sue, do you actually, so you're talking about the, there's a display in the car that tells you what your gas mileage is, but you're not actually calculating it out. In other words, so I've got, 
250 miles out of this tank of gas, and that took 10 gallons. I'm not dividing, but I'm letting the car tell me. Yes. Okay. I I tend to think those things, they're a starting point. They don't really tell you. They can be changed. If you changed a battery or something lately, yeah. it might lose memory. Uh, but I would say, and I don't know how many tanks of gas you've seen that, but I, I noticed one time, you know, when people bring their car into the shop and we're checking out their transmission, we'll jump in it. And to feel the gear shift, we drive the car hard. Yeah. And as soon as we go drive the car hard for five miles, that number, that 17 number that you're seeing has dropped off. So if it stays like that for any length of time, you know, we're talking two, three months, then we got to be concerned that we may have a problem. But if it starts to come back over the next couple months, then I, I don't think we have a problem. Yeah, somebody may have reset it. Or the other thing I was wondering is if there was any check engine lights on, because almost anything that's going to drive her gas mileage down is eventually going to set a check engine light. So Correct. And, yeah, so those things, are they're, they're a barometer, but, yeah, there's a lot of things that can reset them and throw them off, so they're not uh, set in stone. What do you think, Matt? Well, it's a little noisy here, but, you know, I would say that those, well, you know, the way to check your fuel mileage is what you were saying, Dave. Fill the tank, do the math, use your calculator, and that's how you're going to get your fuel mileage. But if she's been relying on that display for all these years, it's probably pretty consistent. But you're right. I would reset it, drive it, see how it does, see if, it go, if she gains it back on the, on the display, and then start using your real math, you know, do, doing the math, doing the calculations. But you've got to remember, too, we need to make sure we have good tire pressures, good, good clean engine air filter, make sure, you know, the oil is changed. Oil changes are going to make you get better mileage, but over the long haul, fresh, clean oil and keeping everything up to date is really going to make a difference. So don't forget about the minor stuff, too. Well, thanks for the call, Sue. Let's go with Gene in Tempe. It looks like on a 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Go ahead, Gene. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, Gene. All right. We'll come back to Gene. Let's go with, looks like in Sun City, Jim with an auto body question. Go ahead, Jim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, thank you. I do have a body question. I currently drive a full-size two-door vehicle, collapse my wheelchair, and pull it in the back seat. But it's old, and I need to replace the car. Cannot find any more a full-size two-door. So what I want to do is buy a four-door, reverse it to the old the door, the back seat, reverse it to the old uh, suicide door. But I'd like to somehow pull the center post out and reinforce the roof so I can pull that wheelchair in. I need a referral to a place that would do that kind of customized work. Well, I think the place you need to be is out here at the Good Guys show <laughs> where all the, all the customizer are. I can guarantee you that would be a, a unique modification for sure. I know. Well, Jim, I, I, send me an email at bumper to bumper radio dot com. Go to the uh, contact link, and I'll do some call around and some research. We do get a lot of calls. People want to do custom this or custom that, and so much of what we do is in mainstream everyday yeah. uh, grocery getters to and from work type stuff. But I will definitely do some legwork and see if I can find you somebody that would uh, would do that kind of work. Yeah. So let's go with Al in Glendale in a 1999 Voyager. Go quickly, Al. We're running, running out of time. All right. I have a, uh, a, a 99 Plymouth Voyager with the 3.0 liter engine, and it's got 176,000 miles on it, and it gets about 20 miles uh, to the gallon in the city and up to 30 when I'm on the road. But uh, it's burning oil, and especially when I start it up from a cold start, uh, when it heats up, uh, there's not so much oil burning, uh, so I'm wondering what's a what's, uh, possibility. Yeah, Kurt, Kurt's got an answer for you. Go yeah, ahead, that Kurt. Th the three-liter, you said a 3.0, that's a Mitsubishi built motor. Yep. They had yep. uh, valve guide problems on them where they dropped out of the heads. So basically you're, the lower end is fine on that, but you're going to probably have to have the heads reworked on that particular engine, and then your problem will go away completely. That sounds real good. So cold, it's it's dripping in the yeah, cylinder. Yeah, it, it runs off past the, the seals and drops into the cylinder. You start it up, you have to burn that oil out. 167,000 miles, so it's ba barely broken in. Yeah, no, we've done a lot of them at that length, and they've still got Kurt, a lot of life. Yes. Kurt, didn't, didn't they used to have, um, you know, I would never dare do it now with that many miles on the car, but on that engine, the valve guides would fall in, and we could actually fix them in the car. You could pick the valve guides back up and then use a, 
cutter, like a pipe cutter, to put a ring around it and then put a circ clip on it, right? Yeah, they had that set up on that one, Matt, but <laughs> have you ever done a transverse motor in a uh, van? Uh, I would I would kind of save, you know, it's probably cost-effective with that kind of miles just to have the heads re- reworked. Well, yeah, yeah, so, so I would never do that now with yeah. that kind of mileage, but yeah, when, they, when, they were, when they were immature in age, yeah. you could do that. Yeah, that yeah. worked. There was a news story this week where a, a guy came up to a gal, old elderly lady in a parking lot, and said, "This fell off your car, and I can fix this for three thousand dollars. What a deal!" Hey, if anyone stops you in the parking lot and says they can fix your car, go straight to bumper to bumper radio.com. Let me give you a little advice. So, thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. Thanks, Kurt, for coming in Thank and you. helping our listeners. His shop is at I-17 in Bell Road. He's just one of the many great shops at bumper to bumper radio.com.